Good day, folks. It's really good to be here with you. And thank you for inviting me into your places and uh, some might say spaces. Um, I just want to remind you, if you've been tracking with our sermon series, The Path to Life, through Psalm 119, we're, taking, we're pressing a pause and this week and next week, leading up to Easter Sunday, we will be spending some time uh, focusing our attention uh, in a few places in the Gospels regarding Jesus in our preparation for Easter. So I'm, hopefully uh, this will be a blessing to you and also help you prepare uh, for um, Easter celebrations this year in the church or in your families or in your own personal life as well. So why don't we start? Uh, the National Retail Federation, which is located in Washington, D.C., conducted a survey of 8,499 exact U.S. adult consumers in early March of last year, 2023. And on the 20th of March of 2023, they released their findings to the press. And the headline was something like this, quote, Easter spending expected to reach $24 billion. Now, the NRF survey indicated the American consumers were planning uh, to spend, in total, $24 billion on Easter 2023. Uh, this would have been an increase of 0.4 billion from 2022 uh, spending and exceeding the previous record of 21.7 billion spent on Easter in 2020. It was expected that 81% of Americans, or about 275 million Americans, were preparing to spend on average at least $192 each on their Easter spending. And the survey went on to break this 24 billion down, uh, 24 billion in spending at Easter into different categories. For example, candy was expected in 2023 to bring in 3.3 billion. Gifts, 3.8 billion. Food, the grocery bill, 7.3 billion. Clothing, 4 billion. Flowers, 1.8 billion. And decorations, 1.7 billion. Just to mention a few of those categories. The NRF also considered the most popular Easter Sunday activities, activities done on Easter Sunday. And of course, the numbers speak for themselves. The most popular Easter Sunday activity came in at 55%, and that was cooking a holiday meal. Next, taking time to visit family and friends on Easter Sunday came in at 50% of those surveyed. Uh, landing at third spot, 43% were planning to attend church on Easter Sunday. And in fourth spot, 34% of the folks were planning to do an Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday. Then the question was asked, what motivated consumers to shop during Easter 2023? Again, the results speak for themselves. Coming in first, when asked what motivated consumers to shop for Easter related items was tradition. Tradition was the response at 63%. Next, a 31% was social activity with family and friends. 29% uh, was the place for promotion and sales. And 23% were pro uh, motivated to shop at Easter simply due to displays and decorations, as probably they walked by the stores. And last but not least, 20% were motivated to shop at Easter due to exclusive or seasonal products because they were shopping for Easter products. So you might be asking the question, what's your point, Pastor? And that's a good question to ask. Of course, surveys are filled with numbers and charts and percentages, etc. But when all this is taken together, we can uncover behaviors. In this case, it was consumer behaviors. Yet when all of this is taken together, we can uncover behaviors. But is not behavior a visible sign of what's important to individuals or even to a culture? Surveys like this uncover in a statistical way what really matters to you and to me. And what really matters to you and to me is not found on a store shelf. What really matters to you and to me is located in our soul, or as the New Testament describes it, our hearts. That's the place where our motivations and our desires are. Who we really are, that's this place called the heart in the New Testament. The NRF uh, survey may have uncovered the heart of the American soul during Easter 2023. 
Now, I don't want to proof text, but I know that we, we know that, I know, we know that Jesus spoke uh, about money and treasure and finances and all that kind of stuff. And he said to, uh, to the people on the Sermon on the Mount, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Well, today we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're turning to Matthew 17. Please turn to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 to 13. And uh, it will be obvious to you, uh, as soon as you turn there, that we're talking about the transfiguration. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by him themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here with you. Here we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Verse 6, When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Verse 9, And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased, so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, as we enter this Easter season. Uh, for many, well on the way since Ash Wednesday. But Lord, I, I just pray as we look at uh, this particular text in Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration of your son Jesus, that you would give us, uh, by your spirit, the wisdom and discernment to understand the implications of this text to us today in the 21st century church and in the individuals as well, in our lives, in our families, and in our culture as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Matthew's narrative describes for the reader an important transitional moment in Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry. And in order for, for us to really understand how important this was, this transition, we need some context. So we begin by putting side by side the transfer, transfiguration account as recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we discover all three share some key events that surround the text before and after this event that we have here in Matthew 17, verse 1 to, 1 to 13. Each gospel writer, of course, writing faithfully in their own style, as they were inspired by the Spirit of God, recording for us these significant events. And we find that each gospel, as we begin that journey, uh, we see that each gospel records the events surrounding John the Baptist, which, who is mentioned in uh, the gospel, in the Matthew 17, 1 to 13, as, the, as Elijah. But we find here that each gospel recorded the events surrounding John the Baptist, Matthew and Mark recording that the Baptist had been executed by Herod, of course, Luke recording Jesus' response to John's questions in regards to his Messiahship prior to his execution. Next, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the Apostle Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ or is the promised Messiah of God. Remember that Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? We find that in Matthew chapter 16, 15, verse 15, Mark chapter 8, and Luke 9. And Peter, being the spokesman for the disciples, said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, Matthew 16, verse 15, and Mark 8, and Luke 9. Next on the calendar, we find that transition, that the transition is, that we find that tradition, holy moly guys, forgive me, we find the transition in Jesus' earthly ministry. Up to this time, Jesus had gone from place to place, place preaching 
uh, what he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. This is from Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, 17. That was after his testing in the desert. Now he begins to gather his disciples and then he goes preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He goes to the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people. But here we have a transitional place in his ministry where Jesus began to, as, he, as uh, Matthew's gospel describes, to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. We find that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, again in Mark 8 and Luke chapter 9. Jesus had been sent to Israel with a message of repentance, and now Jesus set his sights on Jerusalem. That's the transition. Luke in his gospel put it this way, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. You know, friends, when we consider Easter in our cultural context, we have discovered just at the beginning here, statistically, that millions of people, you and me included, see Easter primarily as a holiday. Easter is about bunnies and chocolate egg hunts and family gatherings and shopping. And let's not forget the extra time and a half on our paycheck for the stat holiday, at least that is in Canada, uh, on Good Friday. My friends, Matthew, Mark, and Luke remind us of something that is so important at Easter, that Jesus came to the earth to die for the sin of the world, and this includes your sin and my sin. Of course, spending time with family, shopping for presents, or, or having a family meal together during Easter is okay. But will we take the time? No, will we make the time, my friends, to remember that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, as the text describes in Luke chapter 9. He set his face to go to Jerusalem for you and me and the millions of peoples crowding the malls this Easter season to buy chocolate bunnies. And just in case, just in case, if you wonder what Jesus said concerning our priorities, as Christians in our 21st century culture. Matthew, Mark, and Luke remind us of what Jesus said to his disciples just before his transfiguration. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 27, and Mark chapter 8, and Luke chapter 9 is where you'll find them in those Gospels. Find this in those Gospels. Moving along, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record a statement of Jesus that has questions attached to it for you and me as we try to interpret it. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. We find this uh, also in Mark 8 and Luke 9, as I've been repeating myself there. I just wanted to show you the connection there between all the Gospels. So how are we to interpret Jesus' statement? Well, as you could probably guess, there's been a number of uh, discussions over the years, and I would say more than a number, that's being somewhat conservative, on the different interpretations proposed. One of the most popular interpretations is that the Son of Man coming in his kingdom here in this view is a transfiguration event that we find in the Gospels. Others would suggest that Jesus is referring here to his resurrection or even to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Some believe that Jesus is pointing to his second coming. And others believe that Jesus is pointing to the day of Pentecost. And there's a few more. So how are we to sort this and try and get hone in on what it could possibly be? Well, let's begin by keeping in mind that when we read and study the Bible, we want to seek the plain meaning of the text. In other words, the text that we read is where we usually find the answers to our questions. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record that after Jesus had made a statement 
concerning his coming into his kingdom, we find out that after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, up a high mountain by themselves. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. So the plain meaning would support that the coming of the Son of Man in view here is the transfiguration account that we find in the Bibles. But while we would be wise to seek the plain meaning of the text in our Bible studies, we must also understand that the ministry of Jesus, from his birth to his life, to his death, his resurrection and his ascension, was a fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophets concerning the, pro the promised Messiah of God. And this adds another layer to our study of the text even today and in our Bible studies on our own as well. As one commentator put it, quote, when Jesus speaks of the coming of the Son of Man in verse 28 of chapter 16, he is purposefully alluding to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And why don't we turn to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, and read that together. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I saw, and this is Daniel's visions. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Go back to Matthew chapter 17. Now, you might still be somewhat confused. So we do it this way. We take the plain meaning of the text in view of Jesus' fulfillment of all of the Old Testament law and all the prophecies of the prophets, which is describing that some who Jesus was speaking to in this context, at this time, would see the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Here, Jesus fulfilling another prophecy of the Old Testament. In other words, that Jesus would receive the kingdom from God the Father within the lifetime of his hearers. And we see this lived out in Matthew's Gospel. We go to the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28 and verse 28, where Jesus said, and to say verse 28, Matthew 28, verse verse 18, I should say, and Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here is that fulfillment of Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. And additionally, of course, we take the plain meaning of the text of Matthew 16, 28 to mean uh, to have in view the transfiguration itself as well. So you may be wondering uh, where I am going with all this, and, the, and here's the point. When we open up the Word of God, context is crucial. That's why we've gone through some of the context of Matthew 17 before uh, all the event happened in Matthew 17. When we think what we, thi what we think about the statements that Jesus said in uh, the, this text before us is important to our understanding of what we call Easter today. Why, you may ask? Because the Jesus of our text is not the Jesus most people celebrate in our context. Where in this text do you find chocolate bunnies? Where in this text do you find the West Edmonton Mall? Where in this text do you find any of the trappings that many evangelical churches have during the Easter season in their presentations? This text, my friends, is about Jesus, the promised Messiah of God. This text is about to reveal that Jesus is not your best buddy, that he didn't come to give you your best life now. This text is about to reveal that Jesus is going to come one day and judge the living and the dead. This text is going to reveal the mercy and grace that God has found in his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who went to a brutal Roman cross for the sin of the world, for your sin, my sin. This text is going to reveal the glory of the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. This Jesus in our text is not the Jesus that our culture celebrates 
at Easter. Well, moving on into these uh, verses, quickly as we look over these verses of our text, we ask, who's who here in this text? Well, of course, we find the three disciples of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and his brother, John, in verse 1. The text also describes the presence of Moses and Elijah on the mount, verse 3. And in keeping with the Old Testament, Moses representing the law and Elijah the prophets. And remember, Jesus fulfilled all of this, according to Daniel chapter 7. Then we have the presence of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, verse 5. And then we have the second person of the Trinity, Jesus himself, who was transfigured or glorified before the disciples, verse 2. I want us to look some, a little bit at this word transfigured here in uh, verse 2 for a moment. The word, the Greek word that is transliterated is metamorpho, metamorpho. Here the sense is to, quote, to transform, to transfigure, to change into another form. Luke described this change in Jesus' human appearance in this way. His face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. Mark in his gospel provides this tale concerning Jesus' garments. Mark said his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Mark 9, 3. So friends, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find at this transitional point, of Jesus' ministry, that his appearance was changed on the Mount of Transfiguration. This was similar but different than what Moses experienced on Mount Sinai, who after coming down from Mount Sinai, his face shone because he was, had been in the presence of God, and he put a veil over it, Exodus 43, verse 29 and 35. With this in mind, Matthew describes the transfigured Christ in this way. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light, verse 2. Here's the point, my friends. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples were witness to God's glory. The Bible calls this Shekinah glory. This is the manifestation of God, the Son's perfection. His pure holiness, His splendor, His greatness, His awesomeness. The disciples were witness to what soon would be a reality, the risen and glorified body of Jesus Christ on that first Easter Sunday morning. Can I ask, how would you have responded? Put yourself in their sandals. How would you have responded to such an event if you were there with the disciples on the mount? Maybe you would have responded like Peter who said, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I'll make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 4. Think about it. Here were the disciples in the presence of of the glorified Jesus. And Peter decided he would treat Jesus as equal to Moses and Elijah. Isn't this something we can do? Bring Jesus down to our level? Make Jesus like us? Remove him from the right hand of God and put him in the passenger seat? Say things like, Jesus is my co-pilot? That's what our culture does. Notice that even as Peter was still speaking, what happened? A bright cloud overshadowed him, and the voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, Matthew 17, 5. And when they heard this, what happened? They fell on their faces and were terrified, Matthew 17, 6. And it was only when Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear, that they lifted up their eyes and realized that Jesus was there alone. Verse 7 and 8. I think in the church today, no, I know in the church today when we speak of the fear of God, we usually, th think of in, we usually think of this in terms of reverence of God, and rightly so. We should have a reverence of God when it comes to the commands of God that we find in the Word of God. This is part of what it means to worship God. Part of what it means to love God with all who we are is to have this reverence of God, this obedience to God. And my friends, to the degree we understand and agree with the Bible's description and teaching concerning Jesus Christ is directly proportional to the depth of our relationship and worship of Jesus Christ. In our hyper-individualistic church culture, the fear of God 
has been replaced with a familiarity that is foreign to the word of God. It's foreign. Jesus, for example, when speaking of the false teaching of the religious rulers of Israel, warned his disciples to beware of their hypocrisy. That's in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. He warned them to have no fear of those who, who could kill their bodies or kill the body, Luke 12, 4. Because there was nothing else they could do after that, of course. But Jesus warned the disciples to fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him, Luke 12, 5. Well, at this stage of the game, my friends, we have to press pause. There is so much more that we could do with this text. What will we need? Uh, we need to press pause. And uh, we will need to leave the rest to ask an important question. What are we to do today with this event, the transfiguration? And I think the answer is most likely found in another question. What is Easter all about? Do we go from this place and today, today and become a, a data for the stats like in consumer surveys? Is Easter really about chocolate bunnies and egg hunts and shopping? Is Easter even about family gatherings, as much as a blessing that is? Is Easter that superficial to us? Another holiday on the calendar. On Good Friday, some of us will gather to remember that old, old story on Calvary, where on that day long ago, the one who gave his disciples a glimpse of his glory on the mount would be nailed to a brutal cross. And I thank God that Jesus knew how much his father loved him just before he bore my sin on that bloody cross, that he would rise on the third day. I thank God that's what Easter is all about. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the Easter story. We thank you for this account of the transfiguration. I pray for each one that is hearing this. I pray, God, that you, this Easter, would meet them where they're at and that they would surrender their lives to you and trust the Bible and trust the Word of God to describe who you are and what Easter is all about. For your glory, we pray these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. Shalom.